The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show, someone I've really looked forward to speaking with. He is an expert in the Bitcoin space, and we are going to have an incredible conceptual conversation on the future of Bitcoin and maybe the past of banking, the gold standard, etc. So I'm super, super, super stoked to welcome Nick Carter to the welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thanks, George. Excited to be here. Okay, so for my viewers and listeners who might not know your full backstory, can you get us up to speed there? I'm sure everyone on FinTwit knows exactly who you are, but uh, for those people who aren't on FinTwit, uh, you can give them the Reader's Digest version. Sure, yeah, it's funny because people on Twitter think that I'm just a professional tweeter, like someone who does tweets, uh, but I actually, you know, do stuff outside of that, believe it or not. Um, so, um, so I, as you say, I'm a Bitcoiner. I um, have been almost a full-time Bitcoiner for the last five years or so, um, you know, from an academic perspective and now as a, pra a practitioner. Um, I just am a Bitcoin enthusiast first and foremost. And then in about 2015, I tried to figure out how I could actually put that to work, like how I could work for Bitcoin. And I decided to go to business school because I didn't have any better ideas than that. I was like, well, maybe, you know, I'll learn a thing or two about crypto in business school, which was totally not the case. They were very much against it. And uh, I did, wrote a few things and ended up at Fidelity as their Bitcoin analyst in 2017. So my job there was to develop a research perspective on Bitcoin because they were planning to offer it as a product to their institutional clients, uh, which they ultimately did in 2019 through Fidelity Digital Assets. So my work at Fidelity was part of that, you know, effort to deeply understand Bitcoin as it, you know, fits into the traditional asset class uh, discussion, right? Uh, so to take a more, you know, describe Bitcoin in the language that finance people would understand, basically. After that, I, uh, I had my own startup called Coinmetrics, which I she had started a business school, which was devoted to blockchain analytics. So a lot of the data that I rely on as an analyst comes from that corporation, effectively. So it was initially set up to solve a problem that I had, which was a lack of blockchain data, high quality blockchain data, basically. Uh, so basically set that up and uh, it's now a sort of series B company with 25 or so employees and they license data to various institutions that want to understand blockchains better. But my really my full time job now, I left Fidelity and I run a, a seed stage venture fund uh, along with my co-founder, Matt Walsh, um, and we basically invest in businesses building financial infrastructure on top of blockchains. So not really token focused, much more equity focused. Um, trying to finance the entrepreneurs that are looking to make this asset class actually usable. Uh, so custody, brokerage, exchange, things like that. Uh, and then alongside all that, I also like to write about Bitcoin. So that's actually what people know me for is my written work. How did you get into Austrian economics? Because I've heard you on several podcasts, one where you did a debate with uh, Mike Green Grant Williams, which was really, really fantastic. I'd strongly suggest people checking that out. But, you know, obviously, you know, economics well. So were you self-taught there? I'm assuming you didn't learn that in business school. No, no. Yeah. I mean, so my undergrad was philosophy. So I guess that's maybe sort of helps a little bit to understand Austrian economics. Economics is a branch of philosophy originally, you know. Um, Adam Smith was a philosopher first and an economist second. Uh, but yeah, business school is much more mechanic, you know, it's like, how do you do a discounted cash flow? How do you do equity valuation and stuff like that? No, no mention of Austrian economics whatsoever. Really not a lot of economics discussion there. Uh, it was all actually, it flowed south from my interest in Bitcoin. So I was a Bitcoiner first and then an enthusiast in terms of Austrian ec ec economics second, which I think is not the way that many people go. I think that's probably the opposite way. Yeah. So I just loved Bitcoin. And then I'm like, oh, wow, there's all this strong theoretical and sort of conceptual grounding and justification for the phenomenon. I should probably learn that. <laughs> so I learned a lot of from, you know, Saifedean and 
the resources that like people like Michael Goldstein and Pierre Richard, you know, put together for the community. And so that was my introduction to Austrian economics was through Bitcoin. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's move on and discuss kind of the future of Bitcoin. And I think a lot of people, they conflate the future of Bitcoin with the price of Bitcoin. And I, I, I think it's a more interesting, and I, I could be wrong, if we kind of compartmentalize the two, because I think that, that Bitcoin could go to, I mean, you name the price, 100,000, uh, 500,000, uh, while at the same time, it doesn't necessarily have to become global money. In, or, in, in other words, there is no fiat. There is only Bitcoin. There, there, all transactions globally are done in Bitcoin. All lending is done in Bitcoin. I don't think it has to get there in order for uh, people's price targets, let's say, even optimistic price targets to be hit. So, um, you know, the price is just, is just pretty much simply supply and demand type stuff. But uh, as far as it becoming global money, I think that's a, a really interesting topic of conversation. And so I'm sure you've thought this through. Uh, what do you see? Are you someone that believes that Bitcoin will be global money and replace fiat? And if so, kind of what are the step-by-step the -step process that in your mind, the, the highest probability of how it would play out? Yeah, that's a great question. And I agree, you can totally disentangle the price discussion from the general monetary penetration discussion. Although, of course, you know, if you have this optimistic view about Bitcoin, the monetary protocol, the monetary system, and things go according to plan there, most likely that has a very positive effect on price. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I don't know if there is a plan. I mean, I can't speak for Bitcoin. You know, it's this very organic thing that has so many different stakeholders worldwide now. If I were to put forth, you know, my opinion as to a plan, I have no enforcement or I have no ability to enforce that. All I can do is sort of suggest avenues. The Bitcoiners can sort of try and take the asset. Um, but that's the kind of the beauty of Bitcoin is that it's so resistant to capture or it's resistant to people putting these intricate plans in place. Um, so honestly, there is no plan. It's just almost like wait and see, like, okay, how does the world react to Bitcoin? What kind of products are built around it? How does Wall Street financialize it? You know, how do we sort of the stewards of the protocol make sure that it works? And then it's almost like letting it run free from there. I can sketch out a vision for what that process might look like for sure. But I would not, um, I think it would be really presumptuous to you know, claim that there was a plan or that I was uh, in any way, you know, speaking for Bitcoin kind of thing. What needs to happen for the volatility to uh, to lower to the point where it's uh, has the volatility of gold, let's say? I think that's going to be a challenge. First of all, there's a structural factor, which means that uh, Bitcoin will always be most likely always be more volatile than gold, in my estimate, because gold has a supply response function to price movements, right? It has the supply elasticity. So if, you know, the price of gold massively skyrockets, a bunch of mines turn on. And a lot of economists talk about this is, you know, a lot of new mines will come on that are profitable at those thresholds of price. And, you know, so that effectively attenuates the, um, the, the reaction function, right? And similarly, if gold price drops, then a lot of mines turn off and the new flow of gold decreases. So that's a nice countercyclical pressure which keeps the gold price from being too volatile in the long term. Bitcoin, by contrast, does not have that. Um, in fact, Bitcoin is specifically designed to be perfectly inelastic with regard to price in terms of the supply. So, um, Differ, Nick, if we had fractional reserve banking or lending that was based on Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I it's hard to forecast how that would work, but yeah, you'd effectively have a money supply, which was sort of independent of the base money to a certain extent on Bitcoin. And you imagine that that would be more a function of the credit cycle at that point. Um, but 
just considering the base asset itself, like Bitcoin is built, custom built to be completely inelastic with regards to price from a supply perspective. So you're always going to have volatility. That's, in my view, a feature because we are getting this really nice property of extreme monetary soundness and this very direct conveyance from demand uh, into price with no, you know, it's sort of a very pure signal from demand through to the price itself. But a lot of people dislike that feature and they wish that it had more moderation. But that's sort of what you're getting when you buy Bitcoin. You know, you have to come into it with sort of open eyes. The other thing I'll say about volatility is that um, I view volatility as a function of uncertainty and the market is very uncertain about Bitcoin, of course. Nobody, no two people have the same valuation for Bitcoin, same expectations of its future trajectory. So it's not surprising that it's super volatile because there's so little consensus as to what it should be, what evaluation methodology is composed of. So maybe, you know, in 10 years time, when you've got a bunch of sell side desks with, you know, really high quality research analysts that are crypto natives and they'll deeply understand Bitcoin and the price drivers. At that point, you have less volatility because there'll just be a better institutional understanding weighted by capital, um, you know, better understanding of Bitcoin. And so it'll be slightly less volatile if I had to guess. So, OK, if it's going to remain slightly more volatile than gold, my next question would be, how does it work from a standpoint of lending? Because if we move into a, a Bitcoin dominated monetary system, let's say, um, yeah. the fact remain, I don't care how deflationary it is or, or, or whatever, uh, people are going to need home loans, they're going to need car loans. Uh, you've got the euro dollar market, you've got foreign corporations, you've got corporations that are going to need, uh, there's, it's gotta be, there's gotta be some debt in the system or else mm -hmm. the, the growth, the, our economic growth will be constrained to some degree globally and locally. So if it's volatile, that's what I was trying to think through the other day when we were on Clubhouse. And yeah. I, was, I was thinking, okay, well, if it's appreciating in value like it is right now, and I, I know longer term, we have a lot less volatility, but if it's appreciating, then what's your interest rate there that you would be as a borrower you know, like right now to take it to an extreme, there's no way that you would borrow, like, let's call it five Bitcoin to buy a house. If you knew that you had to pay back those same Bitcoin in five years, if you thought the price of Bitcoin was going to be $500,000, <laughs> that, that would be a, that would not be a good deal. So how, if it remains as volatile, how do we incorporate lending in the system to where it, it can take over the entire monetary system itself. Does that make sense? Of course. No, it's a great, great critique. I heard the same question from Larry White, you know, the economist at Cato, when I had the same conversation with him. And his objection is that there's no Bitcoin denominated credit. And that's the foundation of a monetary system, really. And what's interesting is there is a Bitcoin lending market. There is a Bitcoin interest rate. Um, it just happens outside of the banking sector. It happens at fintech companies, basically. Um, so you've got all these lenders. You know, we're investors in BlockFi, for instance. You've got Celsius, Nexo, Genesis, uh, Ledin. Like, there's a number of them. And collectively, my guess would be their their collective loan portfolios are sort of 20 to 30 billion plus in the aggregate. Um, so, you know, there's material credit creation that occurs in Bitcoin lending and, out the actual Bitcoin at a specified interest rate. Yeah. And the Bitcoin interest rates are like seven to 10% typically. And as a depositor into one of these services, you'll get paid slightly less than that because they of course take a spread. Um, but yeah, so the weird thing is that lending does occur and then you might ask, okay, well, what are the conditions under which lending occurs? Well, as you sort of hint at, it has to be a situation where you have a Bitcoin denominated cash flow coming out the other end. So you can match the maturity of your asset and your liability. So the people that borrow Bitcoin are basically Bitcoin related businesses that can earn, you know, they can put that Bitcoin to work and they specifically need Bitcoin um, and they can earn Bitcoin denominated cash flows out of that. So 
it would be market makers, it would be arbitrage funds, it would be proprietary trading desks. Those are really the big ones. Then you also have Bitcoin exchanges, interestingly, and you have sort of other Bitcoin service providers like Bitcoin ATMs. Anyone that needs liquidity in Bitcoin, that wants to lower their cost of capital, that has the capacity to earn Bitcoins. And, um, you know, so they have sort of their cash flows of this correlation of the Bitcoin price, right? And you might ask, why would an exchange want to borrow Bitcoin if all the exchanges are meant to be like fully solvent, backed and so on, because they're kind of like narrow banks. And an interesting thing is that they don't actually necessarily want to, um, you know, pull all their Bitcoins out of cold storage to honor client withdrawal requests and things like that because of how cumbersome it is to engage in sort of key management. Oftentimes, even if they're fully reserved, they might actually um, take advantage of a liquidity facility like a lender um, to honor withdrawals because they don't want to upset their sort of intricately poised uh, cold storage uh, situation. So interestingly, these Bitcoin service providers will borrow Bitcoin um, in order to obtain sort of hot wallet liquidity, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so there's there's like interesting reasons why people borrow, borrow Bitcoin out there. And then, of course, that's like a really narrow set of entities. I would expect that to see that grow as the Bitcoin economy grows. But yeah, it's like a pretty, pretty niche, um, you know, asset class right now, I would say. Yeah, I think the key takeaway there, though, is in order to borrow Bitcoin into the foreseeable future, it, it's you'd have to have Bitcoin cash flow, because if you've got yeah. fiat cash flow and Bitcoin debt, you could run into some some big problems right there. <laughs> and who knows what who knows what what that interest rate would be. So I guess, like in my mind, I see it as okay. We've got to make it transactional. If it's transactional, then it's lo- reducing vol. And then also once it's transactional, so the average person or entity would have Bitcoin cash flow, then it could take on this life of your, your typical debt that we know uh, today in society. So I guess the next question becomes, how do we make it transactional? It, it not, not just from you know, uh, this uh, investment group to this investment group, but more so, mm-hmm. You know, you're going down to your grocery store, you're using Bitcoin, you're going to the, the, the restaurant, you're buying a car, X, Y, Z. Yeah. So today it's suitable for kind of larger purchases where you want final settlement, right? So it would be more common to see a yacht or a house be paid for with Bitcoin than it would. Price of transactions or the price. Yeah, right. Yeah, because there's a transactional cost. I think your average or median transaction fee today is probably like $15 if you want to get into the next block. Yeah. So like wiring money. Them. Yeah. So I really exactly the way to think about it, like a wire. That doesn't mean that, you know, the fed wire system is bad because it has a high transactional overhead. It just means that it's a different set of trade-offs compared to, you know, a payment system. And I mean, of course you understand this, but a lot of commentators in the press don't like they'll compare Bitcoin to visa and say, well, Bitcoin does one one hundredth of the transactions that Visa does. So, you know, it's a worse system. It's just a very different system. You know, you're not getting final settlement with Visa. Uh, You Visa is a payments network that's like five layers above, you know, the actual acquirer and merchant banks where the settlements occur. And one, you know, interbank settlement that's probably happening on ACH or Fedwire or chips, that's probably, you know, clearing hundreds of thousands or millions of individual credit transactions, right? Um, So Bitcoin should be compared to those slow moving utility scale, kind of like real time gross settlement systems would be what I would compare it to. So the question is like, okay, well, why would you want to use an industrial settlement system to clear value? And I think it's if you are settling value between mutually untrusting counterparties, especially on a cross border basis where you want relatively rapid final settlement with strong assurances that's what when you would use bitcoin so international trade export businesses payroll even if you have a globally distributed team you know things like that um b2b payments um 
you know, those kinds of like high assurance, high integrity payments where you may not necessarily trust your counterparty. You might have to hop over a few jurisdictions. You don't want to go through the correspondent banking system, things like that. That's where it makes the most sense today. Now that said, like people are actively building payment style networks on Bitcoin, and that's going to introduce a whole different set of trade-offs like Lightning, for instance, you know, we're looking at startups that are using Lightning for, you know, streaming payments on the Internet. So instead of, you know, it, you could even set it up for, for your podcast if you wanted, you know, people could pay per minute and those settlements would be streaming to your account directly. Um, that doesn't really work with the way that payments work on the Internet today because you have to have kind of a minimum size for them to be vi to be viable. But with something like Lightning, you could have that constant tiny stream of micropayments. So it gives you more program, you know, configurability once you introduce other layers that are built on Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, the base layer itself is like really, really limited in what it is suitable for basically. So for the layman, what are the trade-offs with Lightning? It sounds like that could be a potential solution uh, to get us to that point where it's transactional, where again, we reduce vol, introduce debt and whatnot. But uh, for the person who doesn't really, you know, is really interested in Bitcoin, they understand it to a certain degree, but they don't really understand Lightning. How does it work? And then what are the trade-offs? Yeah, so I would compare Lightning to like a bar tab. So you go to the bar and you order a drink and maybe you order 10 drinks, you know, over the course of the night. Yeah. Um, all, all the bars around me are closed. So I, you know, I can't even remember the last time I was at the bar, maybe one day I'll, I'll be able to go to a bar again. Um, I've so gone you, up for both of us, Nick. <laughs> so, so you order your favorite beer. My favorite beer is Coors Light. People give me a lot of crap for that. But, oh, that's uh, why I used to drink in college too. Yeah, they used to give me crap too. They say, oh, you're drinking that water. You're drinking the water. But I always used to like No, it's great. You know, when the mountains turn blue, you know, that's how you know it's cold, of course. <laughs> you, need, you need a visual signifier that it's cold. Otherwise, how are you meant to know that it's cold? You have no other way of knowing. Anyway, so you, you go to the bar, you're drinking 10 course Light. You only need to pay once, right, when you settle your tab. But you've done 10 transactions, right? So the, in this analogy, the Bitcoin base layer is that one final payment that you do at the end of the night. And those 10 transactions where... You're going back and forth between you and the bar uh, with IOUs, basically. Uh, th those are the Lightning payments. So, you know, Lightning sort of industrializes that. And of course, it's done in a more automated way. But it basically allows you to batch together many individual payments um, with your Bitcoin tab. With the Bitcoin tab. And then the beauty of Lightning, of course, is that not only do you have a channel between you and the bar at that point, a payment channel, but you know, if you trusted your buddy Rick um, and you have a channel with him open where you're settling IOUs, now all of a sudden he can settle up with the bar without having a relationship with the bar because he can go through you. So Lightning basically uh, codifies those relationships and it doesn't have, there's not a lot of trust requirements because if something goes wrong, you just settle the state of that channel to the base layer. Uh, so you just go to the Supreme Court, so to speak, which is Bitcoin itself, uh, and you sort of settle up down there. Uh, so the, the trade-off is that it's pretty complex and it's like harder to understand. And if you're really using Lightning directly as an individual, like you have to do some channel management uh, and sort of manage your liquidity. But I would expect that ultimately, you know, smart startups that are building on top of this stuff would figure out how to abstract that away and regular people could just benefit from the system without worrying too much about the guts the same way that when you make a credit card payment you're not really thinking much about you know the 10 discrete steps that occur where your payment is authorized and your merchant bank is communicating ultimately with an acquiring bank and all of these financial institutions are sort of communicating with each other and all that results in you getting a coffee. You're not even aware of that stuff. Same thing with Lightning, I think. Ultimately, end users aren't going to need to know or really care about the guts of the system. Okay, so that makes sense. What In, in my mind, what we're describing, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm, I'm 
I don't know tech and you know, I almost flunked out of high school here. So, but I, I just see this uh, or the dollar for that matter, uh, any sovereign fiat currency as a network because it's being mm -hmm. lent, you've got banking institutions, you've got the central bank, you, you've got the users. So it, it's creating this. And so we have all these competing networks so for Bitcoin to uh, take over, let's say, uh, from the dollar, it's going to have to compete with the, the dollar-based uh, network. So I know the argument, uh, I, well, I'm guessing, the argument from a lot of the, the Bitcoin community would be, well, it's going to do that easily because it's so superior to the, the dollar network. Um, but yet when we talk about like an altcoin competing with Bitcoin, if it's superior, there's no way an altcoin can do it because the Bitcoin network, it has a head start. And so it, it's kind of two different uh, arguments there. It's the same yeah. argument of how you wanna look at it based on what your view is. So my point there is if we can assume that Bitcoin has such a head start that there's no way an altcoin can compete with it, even if it is superior, then how does the Bitcoin network compete with the dollar network because the dollar network has such a head start? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I, I and honestly, a very original point. I haven't heard that yet, I would say, but um, it is a double standard if you were to try and argue that way. You're right. Um, the first thing I'd say would be, you know, Bitcoin's advantage relative to altcoins, I would say is not just a function of its head start in you know purely mechanical sense okay i think it has sort of values that are embedded into the system that most of its competitors do not possess basically so the main one would be a monetary credibility so a real commitment to monetary soundness and a specific supply schedule that's something that very few altcoins even aspire to have mostly they compete on kind of a technical basis which in my mind is completely wrong-headed right i mean it's not actually about the technology at the end of the day. It's about, are you creating a politically neutral and fair network with no insiders, you know? So Bitcoin knows the game it's playing. A lot of altcoin competitors don't even know the game they're playing. They don't even know the rules of the game. They just have this naive view that, oh, if we create like slightly different cryptography or maybe different transactional types and we sort of tinker here and there, we'll just take over because our system is obviously better. Totally not how it works. You know, you're right. It's partly the network, but it's also what are the values that are encoded in that system? What's the respect for property rights? Like, what is the development process? Is, is there a commitment to genuine security? Um, what was the issuance like? Was the issuance one where there was sort of monetary fairness? Uh, was there a lot of seniorage where one third party took control of 20% or 30% of the supply at inception? Like, those are really important distinguishing factors, which I would say set Bitcoin apart from most of the competitors. If you look at Ethereum, it's number one competitor. Ethereum doesn't compete along the domains that make Bitcoin great because Ethereum knows it can't compete there, right? What, what does Ethereum compete on? Expressivity, more programmability. It competes on a fast pace of innovation as opposed to Bitcoin's relatively slow deliberate pace. It competes on having more centralization, more hard forks, a more frequent pace of updates, and basically flying closer to the sun in terms of taking on risk. Um, and then, you know, Ethereum aspires to be this network that lots of different tokens live on, whereas Bitcoin is mostly is in service of the one asset on Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin. So, you know, Ethereum was kind of smart about it because it knew it's never going to have more monetary credibility than Bitcoin. It's never going to have a better launch mythology, a launch story than Bitcoin. And so the Ethereans kind of understood that. They're like, okay, well, we're going to make something that's totally different, totally different trade-offs, and we'll do our own thing. And so Ethereum had success doing that. But if Ethereum tried to adopt Bitcoin's approach to soundness and deliberate pace of development and security, it wouldn't be able to successfully do that. And it probably wouldn't be able to compete on that basis. So. That's my quick note on, you know, the competitive dynamics. Yeah, just one note there. When you were saying that, it took me back to a conversation I recently had with Lynn Alden, our mutual friend. And uh, she pointed out something that I had no idea, that Satoshi 
mined his own Bitcoin that he didn't even yeah. give him, or he or she didn't even give themselves uh, Bitcoin at the beginning. They, they, they earned it just like everyone else did. Yeah. And it's, it, there's a real beauty to that. There was no pre-mine. Satoshi went to the stakeholder group that they thought would be the most interested people in Bitcoin, which was the mailing list. They gave them, they released the white paper on October 30th, 2008, started mining uh, January 3rd, 2009. So it gave everyone a long heads up. Everyone that Satoshi thought might be interested, basically, it gave them a long heads up. Then for the first year, Satoshi had to have a big share of mining because nobody cared about it, basically. Yeah, and no one mined it. <laughs> so Satoshi like kept it alive. But interesting, was it looks like Satoshi put a kind of a speed bump into their mining. So whenever they'd mine a block, they would pause their equipment. This is sort of what some new evidence shows us. Whenever Satoshi or the entity that people tag as Satoshi mined a block, they'd actually give themselves a deliberate speed bump to kind of give other miners the opportunity to catch up a little bit. And then, of course, we know that Satoshi never moved any of the coins that they mined. So Satoshi never took advantage of their spoils. All of those coins they mined are sitting in little 50 Bitcoin outputs, several thousand of them that are visible on the blockchain. You can see them in 2009, early part of 2010. There's a cluster there. And only, I think, one or two of those outputs were ever spent. Like there's one famous transaction to Hal Finney. But yeah, so the entity known as Satoshi, as far as we can tell, A, they competed in the free market competition. They could have just consigned themselves 10% of the coins if they wanted. They didn't. And then B, um, you know, didn't really take advantage of those spoils as far as we can tell. It would be their right to. I wouldn't begrudge Satoshi that. But yeah, so that's part of the mythology around Bitcoin. But it's a genuine... You know, it's based in fact, it, you know, it's not just this like pr Promethean myth, you know, Satoshi sacrificed themselves for us. It's real. I mean, it's amazing. Satoshi legitimately never took advantage of their bounty, which is worth, as of today, 50-ish billion dollars. I mean, think about that. You created this amazing system and you never really harvested a single cent from that. That's amazing. I'm, I mean, what kind of inhuman restraint must you have? to uh you know to not ever collect any of the those bitcoins the buddhist yeah. monk of free market austrian economics <laughs> and decentralized money <laughs> and i mean if you think about the other digital cash experiments like digicash that was david chom's company right david chom like sought to profit from that 100 percent. and david chom went out and got patents and stuff like that um you know paypal was a corporate objective you know even though they kind of wanted paypal to be like bitcoin in the early days if you read some of what they said the founders of paypal you know e-gold that you know these these pre-bitcoin digital cash projects had known founders they were typically wrapped in corporations and there were often patents involved satoshi was anonymous sought no patents whatsoever did it in a fully open source way and as far as we can tell didn't collect a financial reward for their efforts so they drew a sharp distinction with what the other digital cash entrepreneurs had been doing, which is pretty impressive in my mind. Yeah, for sure. Another strength I think it has that I just wrote down here in my notes is that um, because of this backstory, if you will, I mean, if you read a book on branding, like, like Primal Branding is a book that a lot of YouTubers uh, read for to grow their channel. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I mean, this is how you build a community. I mean, it's, it's just like um, a perfect way to, to build brand loyalty, if you will, is with this backstory. And that's why I think one of the strengths of moving back over to the Bitcoin price now is that you have so many people that just flat out won't sell. They just, they, they won't sell regardless of the price. The price could go to 10 cents and they won't sell just because they feel as though they're part of a community, they're part of a mission, they're part of a cause. And the, the origination story that you just went over, I think has uh, a lot to do with that. Well, it really resonates with me. And, you know, I've committed and decided to spend all my energy for the foreseeable future on the advancement of this concept in whatever way that I could. And 
it just so happened that life took me down this specific trajectory, but it could have been anything. All I knew is that I wanted to work on Bitcoin in service of Bitcoin because it was this, it's this ideology and this system of values that I believe in. So people really think of it as a technology, but ultimately I see it as a technological instantiation of some very specific political values. And that's not to say political like partisan, but political in that it's proposing an alternative model for society, which is one that I align with. And, you know, all of my peers do as well. So, yeah, it's incredibly potent from that perspective. Okay, so let's talk about how David defeats Goliath here in the sense that, that Bitcoin defeats the dollar network going back. I've tried to give this some thought and the conclusion that I keep coming to because of, you know, the, the, it's got to do so many things right in order to get through this uh, volatility that we talked about, the transactional component of it, and, the, and then the debt component of it. And I'm not saying that it can't, but there, there's a lot of things that have to happen, and it probably is going to be a messy process, just like anything in the free market. But, I, but then you've got that network effect of the dollar. And I was thinking through this, and I thought, you know, pro- the most realistic way for the Bitcoin network to take over the dollar network would be for the, not necessarily the Bitcoin network to take it over, but for the dollar network just to completely compl- implode to where the, the dollar network is its own worst enemy. And Goliath, if you will, uh, hits himself in the head with a rock instead of David doing it. <laughs> and then David's there uh, to take over and kind of is the phoenix coming out of the ashes. What, what do you think about that theory? So I was going to say the exact same thing, which is that I don't actually think Bitcoin has to do much to really gain in stature relative to both the dollar and then other sovereign currencies. I very much align with the, the Ray Dalio, Lynn Alden, Luke Groman hypothesis that we are at the end of a long-term debt super cycle, you know, where we've reached a level of sovereign and corporate and household indebtedness in the developed world where plundering the currency is really the only way out. So you can do the hard default and literally default, or you can do a soft default where uh, you devalue the currency that your obligations are denominated in. And I actually don't think this is a contrarian view anymore. Maybe it was five years ago, uh, but I, I think this is entirely in the mainstream. It's sort of what everyone expects now is inflation. And now the debate has shifted towards, well, actually, maybe the inflation is good or maybe there's a social, you know, social um, purpose behind inflation, right? Maybe it implies uh, low unemployment. It be right, like in the Weimar Republic, uh, there was low unemployment uh, in the early 1920s in Germany. Um, so you might have thought that was great. There was also a lot of consumption. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, high inflation, low unemployment, actually, it, it, it'll feel good for a while as everyone's, uh, you know, nominal incomes seem to be rising at, you know, f- five to seven percent a year. Right. And, and their mortgages, uh, their mortgage burden gets less in real terms. So people will probably be happy for a while. And of course, you know, the fiscal injections are an excuse for the government to take more control over the economy and, you know, uh, implement their preferred social schemes, right? So everyone, as far as I can tell, is totally aligned in favor of very direct injections of cash into the economy. The central bankers are happy because inflation resolves the, the fiscal position And, you know, everyone expects that the U.S. will now basically undergo some version of what we did in the 40s, where we had low interest rates and relatively high inflation. And everyone seems aligned behind that. And in fact, the people that were denying inflation, it's obviously on the horizon now. Now they flipped and they said, "Okay, inflation is actually good. So I, I expect to see that. I expect to see a soft default. I expect to see virtually the whole developed world, especially in the West, devalue their currencies in concert. So I don't know what the dollar index is going to do, but I do know what the dollar is going to do relative to gold and hard assets like Bitcoin. Or or that's at least what I expect. So I think from that perspective, the dollar is going to be its own worst enemy. And that's something that I think is actually aligned with the policy objectives uh, of people in power. The other thing is that you reference the dollar network. 
the dollar network is getting more exclusionary by the day and worse. It's getting worse, right? So in 1990, the U.S. was the sole undisputed world superpower. They defeated the Soviet Union. They controlled all the Bretton Woods, the neoliberal institutionalist system, right? IMF, World Bank, WTO, UN. The U.S. was at the helm of all these organizations, and they effectively controlled global commerce unilaterally. Today, 20, 30 years later, that's just 100% not true. They've sort of lost their grip on all of these organizations. Um, there's China is creating credible competitors to all these institutions. China is internationalizing its currency. We're seeing capital flows go towards the yuan right now, if you look over the last couple of months. Uh, the world is now entering a multipolar phase, and the U.S. continues to believe wrongly that the dollar network is as powerful as it once was, and they keep on trying to use it for policy objectives like sanctions, targeted sanctions. You know, I, you can't see, but on the bookshelf behind me, I have the book Treasury's War by Juan Zarate. That's basically like the book is like a long brag, basically saying, yeah, we at the Treasury, we became like a policy, like strategic, almost military desk. Like we transformed the sleepy Treasury into this immensely strategic arm of the U.S. kind of political apparatus in order to you know, achieve specific policy objectives by weaponizing the dollar. And they say weaponizing the dollar. To them, that's a good thing, the fact that they turn the dollar into a weapon. But guess what happens? Everybody that uses the dollar now realizes they've got platform risk constantly, including our allies, because they're, the difficulty of exiting that network is what we can hold against them. And, you know, we can constantly threaten to basically deplatform them, which they can't tolerate. So the more we do that, and it looks like the dollar is becoming more and more politicized by the day, both domestically with the resumption of Operation Choke Point and so on, but obviously internationally, the more we do that, the more people are going to look to alternatives. We didn't talk about it, but I think those are going to be the competing networks. It's going to be the digital yuan, uh, the digital dollar, because I think the, the um, PBOC and the Fed will have a, a digital currency, a central bank digital currency soon. And then kind of the third competing network, if you will, uh, may be Bitcoin. And they're just going back and forth. You know, the one thing that I think could give them the central bank digital currencies an edge, unfortunately, is their ability to issue debt at a very low interest rate. Because if you're, you know, foreign corporation XYZ, and you can borrow in dollars at a, let's say, a 2% interest rate, although that's artificial, and the Fed may be holding the bag on that, they don't care because they've got an infinite balance sheet, and they can be insolvent, they can have negative equity, compared to, let's say, a superior network, but yet you've got to borrow at 10%, you know, that corporation is going to take, usually going to take that 2% loan all day long. And then if you've got new money creation that's occurring in the specific currency, then that that basically also creates future demand for the currency itself. So I'm not saying that, that that's the reason why a, a, a fiat currency network will win. I'm just saying that's another cross current there that I've personally been trying to think through myself. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting point. I, I agree. I mean, the government absolutely can subsidize the corporate sector for long periods of time you know, with effectively zombie companies and, and things like that and holding interest rates super low. I mean, effectively, that's what we've had in this country for, for a long time now is uh, effective government guarantees, subsidies. I mean, you look at Q2 2020, government spending as a function of GDP was 55%. So at that point, the government was the literally the majority of the economy, right? So their decisions determined economic outcomes. Uh, it's less than that today, but you know that's clearly we've had this notion of stimulus being permanent, right? Normalized. It's not just a crisis rea reaction; it's just an ongoing uh, subsidy. And so, of course, I expect to see that for the corporate sector. And it's clear, like you know, we don't have true capitalism. Uh, the money is not being priced. The you know the price of money is not freely floating, um, and corporate outcomes are much more a function of your proximity to the state and sort of the decision-making apparatus there. That's very, it's, it's clear to me, yeah. Um, 
And so that's why we see so many business models that rely on subsidies like Tesla, for instance, like Tesla's success is partly due to subsidies that they're able to obtain. Um, and you see business models that are really successful that rely on this artificially low credit, um, especially in, in growth stage venture capital, you know, you, you certainly see that effect. Um, so 100 percent. I, I mean, the question is, like, how long can that Ponzi like situation endure, you know, in certain states that undertake that there are eventually constraints and I think you will see uh, morbidity in the corporate sector the longer that you know endures as creative destruction is arrested and you kind of saw this like in Japan after their bubble in the 90s and early 2000s Japanese firms became much less competitive relative to the rest of the world because they were there were so many zombie companies they were not allowed to fail Japanese firms were and banks were, you know, repairing their balance sheets. And, um, you know, Japan had this like long term solvency crisis um, that they sort of solved by injecting huge amounts of liquidity into the sec into the system. And then the consequence of all that was just that Japanese competitiveness went dramatically down. And, uh, you know, Japanese autos shrank as a share of global sort of car exports, things like that. So that's, yeah, that's the trade-off is just much less vibrancy, um, much less sort of R&D spend, um, and you become a less competitive nation fundamentally. And so, you know, I think that's what would happen here in the U.S. And, you know, right now we, we live in a time of extreme mobility from a capital perspective, founder perspective. You know, the whole idea behind Bitcoin is that, okay, now your wealth is untethered from your sort of geographic provenance. So I think what we would see would be we would see certain havens for genuine capitalism emerge and then other states would lose. They would have dramatic outflows. And we, we even see it within the U.S. today. So we're seeing reshuffling from a more socialist style model in California. You see an outflow to Texas or from extremely high tax burden states up here in the Northeast down to Florida, for instance. Uh, so. You know, you see that within the U.S. I'm sure it could happen on the international scale, too. So, yeah, I think that there's just like ultimate constraints there. But, yeah, the short term dynamics you describe seem very plausible to me. But I but I think you hit on a point that could lead to the downfall of that dollar network system in the sense that if you've got these zombie companies, the production is going down. If the production is going down, so is the amount of goods and services that are produced. If the amount of goods and services that's being produced, let's say even globally or within that dollar network going down, but yet the dollars being created are going up, uh, you know, last year M2 money supply as measured by the government went in dollars, you know, domestically went up by 25%. At the beginning of Weimar Germany, when the seeds were being sown for hyperinflation, they were increasing their money supply by 50%. So we're, we're, we're not that far off. So my point is if you're increasing the money supply to that degree, but yet you're reducing the amount of goods and services because you're creating these zombie companies with cheap debt, that, that leads to one thing, the price of goods and services going up. And then I, for, for the viewers and listeners, I wanna point out something. I was just reading this book that Michael Burry referenced in that tweet storm he had the other day about hyperinflation, it's called the dying of money. And I've done a couple of videos on this, but my, my point is from 1920 to 1921, 1922, right around there, the, um, the mark went up against the dollar, up against the dollar. From that point where it started to, to decrease in value, where it started to depreciate against the dollar for the next year, there was a total of 190 marks outstanding, uh, 190 billion, excuse me, in the entire world. In the entire world, there was 190 billion marks. One year later, going into 1923, when the hyperinflation went parabolic, uh, to buy a newspaper cost $190 billion or marks. So one year later, it cost you the entire money supply of a year prior just to buy a newspaper. And the two years prior to that, the currency appreciated in value against the dollar. 
So my point is <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're increasing the money supply to that degree, to your point, initially it feels great. Everyone's making a little bit of money because the rate of inflation isn't increasing as fast as the money supply. Yeah. The people's purchasing power is increasing. But, and that's what happened between 1914, 1918, 1918, uh, 1920, we'll call it 21. Uh, that's to a certain degree, that's what was happening. But you're sowing the seeds of the destruction of the entire system itself. And so my point is, I don't know if we'll do it, but it's, it's the probability is above zero. And uh, it's definitely a possibility. And that could be how Goliath uh, hits himself in the head with a rock. Yeah, and I'll say two things about the Weimar hyperinflation. To be clear, I don't expect a hyperinflation. That's not, you know, in my mind, the likeliest thing. I do expect, you know, significant and sustained inflation over the next probably couple decades here. Um, and I, I do expect people holding dollar, dollar-based assets, treasuries to suffer, right? So very similar to Dalio's thesis, even though he doesn't really like Bitcoin. Well, if you read the history of the Weimar, there's some great books. Um, I've recently been reading a history about it as well, as you can probably tell. There are some interesting parallels. So first of all, France, you know, Germany owed reparations to France after the war, right? Denominated in gold. And that was part of the cause for the chaos because they couldn't honor those obligations, right? France thought that Germany was cheating because Germany kept on saying, we can't really afford these payments to you. But when French tourists would go to Germany, they would see that the cafes were full, consumption was really occurring, people seemed rich, there was full employment, and Germany felt wealthy and rich to the sort of shallow interpretation. And that's because people didn't realize, you know, at a certain point, they collectively realized, okay, we don't really want to hold marks, so we're just going to go and consume, right? Why save? If your currency is being debased, why save? Go consume, go buy, you know, expensive food and clothes, go buy up the inventory of stores and things like that. So there was this huge consumption boom in Germany. France, by contrast, was not issuing their currency at the same rate. And so there's a lot more apparent poverty in France. So all these European nations thought Germany was cheating on the reparations because they seemed wealthy at the time. But really, that was just the consumptive boom look around you, you see a consumption boom happening in the US, kind of looks like that to me. Uh, or we'll see that in the next few years, uh, or months. That was the consumptive boom that, you know, was the prelude to the collapse of the currency. And the second thing I'll say, there was rampant speculation in when Weimar Germany in the early 20s on the stock market, on foreign exchange. Uh, the stock market did very well for a time, right? In particular, in nominal terms, later less well in real terms. The stock market did extremely well. There was massive speculation. It became a household activity to speculate on foreign exchange. And then eventually, you know, like this FX speculators were demonized, as I'm sure will be the case here in the US as well, when we, you know, eventually impose capital controls or whatever. They were demonized because it's like, oh, how dare you, you know, trade uh, foreign currencies and and uh, escape the inflation. I always blame it on the speculators, always. Yeah, I mean, th and that was part of the undercurrent of anti-Semitism, which really, you know, took flight in the 1920s, uh, long before the 30s even, was because the Jews were blamed for the devaluation of the mark. Um, and so, you know, you see those historical parallels and look, none of us expected to go the same way, but it's hard to not take notice of those parallels like you look at the rampant speculation in you know financial markets in the u.s here it's it's like eye-watering and it's not just in stocks it's in all sorts of different uh you know asset classes obviously crypto but also nfts and fine art and baseball cards other collectibles like it's it's absolutely rampant so yeah you know what's interesting on that timeline that, that you mentioned is we and most people from watching my channel know that there's two main ways for m2 money supply or broad money to grow historically it's through the commercial banking system creating more money through the lending process um, or it can be with the government just spending money into existence basically monetized by the central bank 
And I think what you'll notice in going back to the Weimar Germany example is the government was creating all this additional money supply through basically printing the money from call it 1914 to 19, uh, we'll say 1920. And then what happened when you, in that time frame you're talking about when the stock market was booming, I think, and I don't know this for a fact, but it would make sense to me that the banks came in between 1920 and 1921 and said, oh my gosh, this is an economic miracle. We've got to start lending. So because we feel great, they get the FOMO like, like everybody else. Yeah. So then they feel comfortable to start lending and get a, and aggressively lending. So now you've got the government creating all this additional money supply that they had been for so long. They're on that treadmill. They can't get off. And then you've got the banks thinking that everything is great and they're seeing the mark appreciating against the dollar. So they're lending all of this additional money supply into it. And then the trigger there was Gresham's law. And that's when, you know, the people are out in the cafes, it starts that way. And then it goes into asset speculation because they're like, okay, I'm losing value on these marks. Let me buy stocks. Let me buy housing. Let me buy business. Let me buy anything that actually has tangible value. And then the foreigners saw what was happening. They took their marks and started mm -hmm. buying everything in Germany because the, the, the bad money was chasing out the good. And then that's what gave you that exponential growth curve that you saw in 1923. There's a, there's another dynamic too, which is, you know, after the war, there were a lot of subsidies directly from the government, um, you know, to individuals, veterans, you know, people that were sort of injured or disabled by the war households and the unions were extremely strong. There was a very strong socialist undercurrent in Germany at that time, which was, you know, in fact, arguably the far left was probably politically more powerful in the early 1920s in Germany. And the unions were able to bargain for very strong wage increases, you know, and uh, very sticky um, wages. And there were tons of strikes and lots of collective bargaining going on, which meant that effectively, you know, that was a continual draw of newly printed money into the economy. Um, and it was actually, it was, it was the middle class that really lost due to the hyperinflation. Well, ultimately everyone did. But in the beginning stages, manual laborers and unionized workers did great because their salaries were indexed to a certain degree to inflation. Professional classes and the middle classes uh, had uh, kind of stickier um, salaries. They were kind of more fixed and longer in duration. And so they were the ones that got crushed first, interestingly. Um, you know, teachers, um, sort of more white collar uh, workers. Um, and then ultimately, in the end, everyone was crushed by it. But there's a different kind of trajectory to it. Yeah, maybe that's a similarity too, that it started off with stimmy checks. Exactly. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what I was sort of implying is that like, sure, like you can always find a justification to provide direct assistance to, you know, some sector of society, whether it's unemployment or Medicare or whatever, there's always going to be political, you know, capital to do that, I guess. Um, but if it has no limit, you know, if there's no end to it, then you're going to debase the currency. Yeah, yeah. All right, Nick, fantastic conversation. That was so cool. We really went in on a bunch of different uh, tangents and different directions. I think the viewer and the listener is going to get a lot of value. For the people watching this that want to find out more about what you do, where should they go? Well, and I'm sorry I've been out of focus this whole conversation. I need to fix my camera. Nobody cares about that. They just care about the content. Look at me. Well, I don't have any lighting. <laughs> I'm just in a cave on this little desk in my apartment. I got everything boxed up. So I'm retired or semi-retired from Twitter now. I used to tweet a lot and, uh, you know, I, th I think I have to take a break because it's really affecting me negatively. Um, my personal website is nickcarter.info. And then if you want to learn about my fund, that's castleisland.vc. That's dot Victor Charlie. Awesome. Awesome. Nick, thank you again. I can't wait to do it again. George, this was super, super fun. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to join me in Miami this June 11th through the 13th for Rebel 
Capitalist Live, the investment conference. And this is not over Zoom. This is face to face. I'm bringing a lot of your favorites from the Rebel Capitalist Show to Miami under one roof to speak, to give you the knowledge you need to increase your personal freedom, to become a better investor and make larger returns over the next few years when we have this financial uncertainty that's being caused by the Fed and the government. And finally, it's going to give you an opportunity to really take your understanding of macroeconomics and the world around us to the next level. We've got some incredible speakers lined up that are going to completely blow you away. People like Mike Maloney, Jason Hartman, Ken McElroy, Lynette Zhang, Mark Moss, Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, just to name a few. The tickets for this event are really going to sell out fast, so make sure you go to Rebel Capitalist Live right now to get all the details and to reserve your spot. We need to come together as a group, as a community, especially after what we dealt with in 2020 in 2021 so we can learn how to build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments and we need to do this as a group as a community of fellow rebel capitalists so don't waste any time head over to rebelcapitalistlive.com and i will see you in miami